might be turning your Bibles to Exodus, and as you're doing that, I thought of something. I got a had a chance on Monday last week. I think it was Wednesday to go be part of a small Bible study. We uh, one of the things we're trying to do in, you know, in our school here is have a uh, release time where we bring the kids over for a Bible lesson during lunchtime. Well, they're doing that in other places, and so we got to go over to Jonestown and see how that happens at one place, and there was a bunch of second graders in the room, and they asked a little girl to close in prayer, and she came up to pray, and she said a couple things in prayer, and then she said, Lord, take COVID away now. <laughs> Amen. And it was a uh, <laughs> good prayer. Good prayer. And so uh, we all, that was, it was uh, in the second graders were getting it, so uh, that's good stuff. And so when I... Uh, read Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 16, it ends up being the whole chapter. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They came to Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water. There and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stay on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hand, up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar there and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. Now in today's passage, we once again... Meet this group of disgruntled Israelites that become known as the Back to Egypt Committee. And we keep seeing these folks pop up. And they're quite good at being annoying. I think that's the other. There are people who, you know, you talk about everybody has their gift and everybody has their place. Some people have the gift of being annoying, if you can call it that. That's this group. I know I've said that a lot, but it's worth repeating that they spent 400 years stomping in mud pits in Egypt as slaves. Over 400 years of slaves. Every day, every minute, they long to be free. And now since they've been set free, there's this group that all they've done is complained and lobby to go back to Egypt. And this time it had to do with water. There wasn't any water to drink. We're thirsty. You know, which understandably, you know, once you get thirsty, I think we've all been thirsty, it's perfectly healthy to want something to drink. But in this case, they get the quarreling with Moses. Verse 2 said they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses says, What are you quarreling with me for? You know, why do you put the Lord to the test? How many times does God have to come through before them before they trust him? You know, that they would rather complain to Moses than trust in the Lord. I dare say most people would rather complain to some earthly leader than to trust in the Lord. Because why? It's easier to complain, isn't it? It's easier to complain to someone like Moses than it is to trust in the Lord. Because trusting the Lord requires faith. Complaining just takes a big mouth. And the people in Exodus are exhibiting a complete lack of faith and nothing but a big mouth. And oftentimes it's the people yelling the loudest that have nothing to say. Right? They say, why did you bring us out of Egypt? 
so we can be out here and die of thirst. I can't even imagine being in Moses' shoes at this point. I, I would have loved to have been in his shoes when they crossed the Red Sea. That would have been cool. You know? But when, they, when the rabble starts saying this kind of stuff, it gets frustrating. I know if it had been me, I'd have said, you know, if you want to go back to Egypt, do it that way. You know, and have at it if you want to. But good luck recrossing the Red Sea. Because you realize what God had to do to get us past the Red Sea in the first place. You want us to think he's going to port the Red Sea so we can go back? But if you somehow make it back, say hi to Pharaoh for me. That's the guy, that would be what I would say. The smart aleck would be would have, something, would have something snarky to say to Pharaoh. But Moses is a little more patient than I am. And he cries out to the Lord. What am I to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. It's hard to believe that the people are this ready to turn on Moses. And what good is it going to do if they turn on Moses? So they stone Moses. They're still thirsty. And then they're tired from throwing over rocks at them. And then they're probably thirstier, if that's a word. More thirsty. And so it, it's, uh, I know people pick on me because they scratch my head a lot, but there's a lot of head scratchers. It's, it's, it's you know, what are these people thinking? And then God gives some instructions. And he says to Moses, strike the rock. And water will come out for the people to drink. Now, again, what did you just say, God? Hit the rock with a stick, and we'll have water. Yeah, that makes sense. That, that's what we do when we need water, right? So Moses struck the rock, and the elders, he took people with him, and they saw it. And so uh, they strike the rock. And God says, I'll stand before you by the rock of Horeb. And, no, I don't know about you, but I don't care how intimidating the situation is. I don't care how weird the, the calling from God is. If God tells me he's going to stand with me, yep, and that's where we're going to stand, whether it makes sense or not. This staff that Moses used to turn the Nile red, he's now going to strike that rock and the water's going to come out. And you know what? It happened. He smacked that rock. He smacked that rock and somehow, some way, water came out of that rock. And then they gave the place two names. Masa and Meribah. Masa means testing. Marva means quarreling. So they named this place testing and quarreling. And so you go to testing and hang a right and go to quarreling. Right? Because they tested the Lord. They said, is the Lord among us or not? And after all that they had been through, after all that they had been through, they still wonder, is God with us or not? Huh. I'm trying to imagine this water coming out of a rock, though. Experts estimate there are about 2 million people who came out of Egypt. 2 million people. I can't picture 2 million people. That's a lot. I, I, I can't look at a room full of people and say, people in there. I, I, I can't do that. But 2 million people is a lot of people. And that must have been a big rock, wasn't it? Well, that had have been the biggest rock I've ever seen to satisfy not just 2 million thirsty people, 2 million thirsty, disgruntled, quarreling people. Well, we all know that it isn't about the size of the rock, is it? It's about the size of our God. You see, bringing water from a rock was pretty awesome. But what what's about to happen next is even more impressive. Because next up, for Israel, as if being thirsty was the biggest problem they were going to have, is a group of people called the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites, they, 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 were, they were bad people. They were descendants of a fellow named, you may have guessed it, Amalek. You know, who was a grandson of Esau. The guy, if you remember Esau, he's the guy that Jacob stole his birthright. He wasn't real happy about it, but he kind of got over it. But these, uh, these Amalekites are his, the Amalek was Esau's grandson. And they weren't nice people. They raided, they killed the people just for something to do. So when they saw the Israelites coming, they would naturally think, hey, let's, uh, these guys' grandfather did our grandfather wrong. They say, there's a turf war brewing here. We can get back at them. We can destroy them. So they attack them. They attack them. Moses is a good leader, though. He does two important things. He tells Joshua, hey, choose some men and go out and fight the Amalekites. And he says, tomorrow I'll stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And he prepares the troops. He also gets his staff. The same staff he used to turn the Nile red. The same staff he just used to get water from the rock. And by now, we should know it's not about the staff, is it? It's about the one whose power is made manifest through Moses' staff. God told Moses at the burning bush, take this staff in your hands so you can perform miraculous signs with it. That's the staff that Moses got at the burning bush. 
Remember the burning bush. That was another cool moment. Verse 10 tells us that Joshua fought against the Amalekites. And Moses and Aaron and a fellow named Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now this is an interesting battle. Verse 11 tells us that when Moses held his hands up, when Moses held his hands up, the Israelites were winning. But when Moses got tired, he took the stone, they, they put a stone on him, he sat on it, and Aaron Hur held his hands up. One on one side and one on the other, so his hands remained steady until sunset. Moses had done some awesome things for the Lord, but even Moses got tired and needed strong people around him to hold his hands up, to keep the Lord's staff lifted high. Clear up till sunset, enabling Joshua and the Israelite army to defeat the Amalekite army with the sword. You see, up to this point, these Amalekites were undefeated, and they were good. They were, they were good, they were nasty. So we see the Lord coming through again. When the people quarrel and they want to go back to Egypt, brings water from the rock, follows up with an incredible military victory. Let's not underestimate this victory. I said that with the Malachites, they weren't chumps. They were vicious, well-trained, very used to destroying people. Yet when the Lord is lifted up, when the battle belongs to the Lord, there's not an army on earth that can stand up for what our God can do. We have to know that. We have to know that because you never know what kind of army, what kind of battle we're going to face. So we've got to know right now ahead of time that the, 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 the kings and kingdoms are going to pass away. But there's something about that name. And that's, that's, if you forget everything else, don't forget that. And in verse 14 says, The Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. Yeah, as, as I'm getting older, and some of you may be experiencing this too, if you really want to remember something, write it down. You know, more than once if you have to. Write it down. Moses, God's saying, write this on a scroll, Moses. This is something that has to be remembered. And make sure Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So did we hear that? This was far more than another great victory. This is noteworthy. God wants Moses to write down because he's going to blot out the memory of Amalek. Amalek's army was real. They represent the world. The world is passing away. The world will not be remembered when the Lord blots out his memory. No matter what they do, no matter how many times they emblazon their names on things, the world will not be remembered. We're not called to be like Amalek. We're not, God's going to blot out the memory of Amalek. The only reason we even know who Amalek was is because <coughs> Moses wrote it down. Because God told him to write it down. And the only reason they need to know who Amalek was is so we don't do the same thing and fall into that trap that Amalek fell into. Or white white into, because we're called to be different. We're called to be holy because the Lord is holy. And then Moses does something that did something awesome that I that, that I'd love to have been there to see. He builds an altar. He calls it the Lord is my banner. For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. And, and it, it is one of the one of the most I don't know if it's funny, ironic, or stupid. But the war is going to be, the Lord's going to be a war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Yet people keep lining up to join the Amalekite army and fighting against the Lord. As if they think they're going to win. You know? <laughs> um, those who oppose the Lord in any way, shape, or form have joined the Amalekite army. Joshua fought bravely against them and that army. And we went too much to fight bravely against that army. But more important than fighting, and, and we got to understand how we fight. We lift up our hands. We worship and whose name do we lift up? We lift up the name of Jesus. You know, a banner. Moses said, the Lord is my banner. We proclaim the Lord is our banner. Not only the Lord is our banner, the Lord, another name for banner is a standard. A standard is what we strive to attain. The Lord is our banner. The Lord is our standard. Jesus is who we're aiming to please. Jesus is who we're aiming to be like. He's the standard. The banners and the standards of the world just aren't good. They're not good because you know you could, it doesn't matter what standard the world puts up, you can meet that standard every time. Is it going to be good enough? Nope. Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. And you know, the banners and standards of the world, they, they change from one day to the next. You know, one day they say one thing, and everybody says, okay. Next day they, if they say a different thing, everybody says, okay. It's just like, we've got to be smarter than this. Like, hey, uh, that's just not good. That's not good. 
It says on all those all those changes to satisfy people's lust for power, that lust for control. God's our banner. God's standard never changes. That's good stuff. Song of Psalms or Psalms of Solomon 2 4 says his banner over me is. You know how to finish that verse? His banner over me is love. And God's love never changes. Ever changes. His banner never changes. His love never changes. You know, a couple years ago when we were coming through the book of Revelation and, and, and saw that the focus of that book was on worship, our prayers, our worship, is what raises that banner. And it's not about cranking up the flagpole with a string. Our worship raises the banner. It's what Moses is, it's what raises the arms of Moses. When we worship, we instill fear in our adversary. You know, our adversary is the devil. Satan doesn't like it when we worship the Lamb. That's the one banner he'll fight the hardest to keep us from raising, which is why it's the most important thing we do. It's the only banner we need to raise. It's, the most, it's, it's, it's far and away the most important thing we do. The Lord is our banner, and we've got to raise that banner. The Lord is who we lift up. He's our standard. And Jesus raised the banner. You see when he took the bread. When he took the bread and he broke it, he raised the banner because he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> He raised the banner and he took the cup and said, This is my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for what you did that night in the upper room with the bread, with the juice, Lord. And we thank you. That, let it be for us, Lord, this morning, your body and your blood, until you come again and take us to be with you, Lord. May we raise the banner in your name. Amen.